You're watching the sermon of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's sermon is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. If you would take your Bibles and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, if you remember, at one point last year, we talked about that there, by different ones, were questions... Uh, about all the crazy things going on in 2020 and people asking, were these things signs of the end? Uh, As if COVID and some of those natural disasters and murder hoardings were the things, the horrific things that we read about in Scripture that that lead up to Christ's return. And if that were true, that would mean then we would be in the midst of the tribulation, in the midst of that time when God pours out his wrath on the earth. So the question then is, are we in the midst of the tribulation? Are we in the day of the Lord? And back then, we concluded, no, we're not. Now, saying back then doesn't mean that now we should have a different conclusion. Uh, No, we're still not. But why? Well, we said then that the Bible is clear that those events that lead up to Christ's return will be unprecedented. Uh, They will be worse than anything that has ever taken place in history. And that just hasn't happened. But as we continue in our text here for this morning, we come to more reasons, I believe, why we, we can't possibly be in the midst of the tribulation and why these things are not signs of the end. And the answer is because there are things that still need to take place before that day comes. See, we see in our text that somehow some teaching had crept into the church in Thessalonica and convinced the believers there that they had missed the rapture and were in the time known as the day of the Lord, the time of God's wrath being poured out. But Paul told them, That could not be the case because there are three things that have to happen first. And those things are that there there is going to be this apostasy, this falling away. Also, to the Antichrist must be revealed. And in order for him to be revealed, what or who is restraining him from being revealed must remove from the scene, must be taken away. And so as we look at this text, uh, the main idea is that as this teaching has crept into the church in Thessalonica, Paul is writing this section to correct that false teaching, to make sure they understand they were not in the midst of the day of judgment. And so we'll see here that in verses 1 to 2, uh, Paul is pleading with them. Uh, Paul wants them to act maturely, to not be so quickly shaken in mind nor alarmed. And then in verses 3 through 12, he brings the correction that's necessary to them. So let's read our text here for this morning. Again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. It'd be helpful if I was there. Sorry. <laughs> here we go. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction." who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way." And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, 
and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So again, this, this teaching had come into the church in Thessalonica. This teaching that they were in the midst of the day of judgment. And it probably wasn't too hard to convince them of this. Because as we've talked about, they were facing horrible persecution. They were suffering greatly for their faith. And it was clear from last week, they were also suffering other afflictions. And so in all that they were going through, it's probably pretty easy to convince them they were suffering because the wrath of God was being poured out. And so what we see here in verse 1 is that Paul was asking the Thessalonians not to be quickly or easily shaken in mind. Uh, the word shaken here could also be translated as to move or to waver. And in mind, it's talking about their thinking. They, they needed to be thinking about what was right and what was true. And therefore, they needed to have discernment. They need to be able to tell the difference between what was right and wrong and not let their minds run to accepting things that were false. So Paul pleaded with them, again, to not be quickly or easily shaken, nor to be alarmed or to be troubled, inwardly aroused or agitated. And so not only did Paul want them to, or not only was Paul addressing how they were thinking, but he was also addressing how they were feeling. And their emotions. And I think we can understand what, what is being addressed here. In someone being shaken or wavering in their thinking and, and being agitated in their emotions. And so being led to hold on to and grasp things that are false. Even people who know what is true uh, can sometimes go after things that are false. People who, who know the truth. But because trouble comes into their life, because there's some kind of suffering that they're going through, uh, they're easily swayed towards things that are kind of just feel-good things, uh, to help in the moment, but, but really have no, hold no water. Or because they're introduced to a teaching that they really have not thought through, and so they lack discernment, and so uh, their whole faith in life is just kind of thrown into this tizzy because they just, they just don't know what is this thing, and they, gotta, they, they, they almost uh, grasp it right away, and and so many times end up turning to things that are just flaky, philosophical, pseudo-Christian malarkey. It's just this feel-good stuff and fluff. You know, whether when someone's facing their own death or the death of a loved one, and they talk about such things as, as you know, they're, they're, they're just always with me. They're gone, but they're always with me. And we have these things, again, that, that have no, no basis to run after and believe, but they make us feel good in the moment. Or, or there's other teachings, too, that, that people can be easily drawn to. You know, the idea of building oneself up and, and depending on, on oneself and finding their own identity and who they are, uh, kind of like the, the women's book study, that they have to be, be enough, Right? You know, I don't feel enough, I don't feel good, but I have to tell myself I am enough. I'm, I'm mom enough, I'm dad enough, I'm spouse enough, I'm whatever, because you're finding your identity in yourself instead of in Christ, instead of Christ being enough. Also, one of my favorites is that we are princes and princesses because our daddy, referring to God, is the king. And so we're, we're just princes and princesses, and, and we paint... Uh, our life circumstances like a Disney movie, where our circumstances just have these fairy tale endings. Apparently, these people never saw Old Yeller. You know, the dog. And spoiler, in the end, the dog dies. We have to hold to truth and not run to these things that may feel good for the moment, but when tested by life's trials or tested against truth, cannot hold any water. And the kind, this kind of instability in what one knows is true and believes should not be characteristic of a Christian 
of one who holds firm to the truth of the gospel and is growing in maturity in Christ. And so we see through this text, uh, Paul wanted the Thessalonians to be discerning, to not be moved, to not waver in what they knew was true doctrine and what they had been grounded in. See, because false doctrine, false teaching can uproot someone and cause devastation in their faith. Now, we must understand the dangers of false teaching. And therefore, understand the importance of true doctrine, true teaching. That it's true doctrine that keeps us grounded and anchored. You know, even when we're trying to help someone else, you know, we want to meet their needs, and yes, uh, their immediate needs, but even in that, we need to point them to truth. We need to point them to doctrine. Uh, We can meet a felt need. We can meet an emotional need, but what happens when those feelings shift or they come up with other needs that they they feel they have and, and they no longer have the same emotions? What is it that's going to keep them from being shaken and moved? What's going to keep them from becoming alarmed? It's true doctrine. It's the truth of God, his character, his nature, his revealed plan of salvation. And so Paul finds it necessary to correct the false doctrine that has crept in and solidify the Thessalonians in true teaching. Now, with that said, the focus of the text is end times teaching, end times doctrine and theology. And there are different positions different ones take on end times theology. Different ones who are brothers and sisters in Christ that we look at the scriptures and we know this is God's word. And we know this is the infallible word of God. And so we search the scriptures and are working to understand what it teaches about end times theology. And yet we may fall on different sides of things. And wherever we may fall may have an influence on how we interpret this passage of scripture. But I in no way see that as a reason to divide. That we are looking at this as God's word. We hold to the essential truth, the essential doctrines of the gospel and who Christ is and God and salvation. And even those things that are essential about end times theology. But when we fall on different sides, while we are seeking the truth of God's word, as brothers in Christ, um, we are one in the church, one in the spirit together. So it's not a, an area where I, I am willing to divide over. But nonetheless, there are doctrines that are necessary to divide over. You know, like Alistair Begg says, the, the, the clear things are the main things, and the main things are the clear things. Or John Owen says that what God intended to be clear, he made clear. And those essential truths we must unite on, that the Bible is clear on. And so there are doctrines that would put us outside of true Christianity. And so even with that being said, I'd hope we would see the importance of doctrine. And again, this, what Paul was addressing here is end times doctrine, as he is addressing the Thessalonians. And it is specifically referring to, as we see in verse 1, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. And I'm going to argue that what is in reference there is the rapture. That he refers to in these two ways, his coming and our being gathered to him. So somehow the Thessalonians came to believe that they missed the rapture. And so we're in the midst of the day of judgment, the day of the Lord. Again, how did this teaching get into the church there? Well, Again, as we discussed, Paul was pleading with them, As he says in verse 2, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarm. And so what it is, what came in that would make them be shaken or alarmed? Well, this teaching that came either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So whether this teaching crept in by a spirit, which would refer to an utterance of revelation in some way or something posing as an utterance of revelation, coming from some spirit, 
If it's false, then it's not the Spirit of God. It is a false prophecy. And really, too, I mean, whenever we're talking about teaching, all teaching comes from a spirit. And if it's a false teaching, it comes from an evil spirit. Right? Remember when we were in 1 John last year, that John said to test the spirits to see if they are from God. That true doctrine comes from God. But as Paul says elsewhere, there is also the teaching of demons. There is truth that, or not truth, but there is falsehood out there that is satanic in origin. And so, did it come from a spirit? Or has this false teaching come in by a spoken word? And that would be in reference to an oral tradition that was passed. And if it wasn't something that was orally passed on, then maybe by a letter that arrived to the church by someone pretending to be Paul. And so giving this letter the illusion of having apostolic authority. Or two, as Paul says here, seeming to be from us, that could reference both the, what was spoken by word, the oral tradition, or the letter. Could be both. And that very well may be the case. Uh, if you just jump down a little bit to verse 15, and you see what Paul says there. It says, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by a spoken word or by a letter. And then, too, we see what he says at the end of this letter, in chapter 3, verse 17, when he says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. Well, what would be the point of Paul making sure they could clearly see what was a sign of a genuine letter from Paul if there wasn't something that was forgery out there? And so he wants them to see, no, you, you need to recognize what is clearly from me and what would not be from me. And so this is probably how this false teaching got in. So again, we see in verses 1 to 2, Paul pleads with them to act maturely, to not be shaken in mind nor alarmed, nor be alarmed. And so now Paul looks to correct the false teaching here in verses 3 through 12. In verse 3, he says, let no one deceive you in any way, whether it's by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. He's calling for them to be discerning. And the reason he gives that they should not be deceived in this particular case is that before the day of the Lord, which we've discussed what the day of the Lord is, it's not a day, but a time period uh, that includes the tribulation where God pours out his wrath on earth, and includes Christ's return, which the tribulation leads up to, when Christ comes again in judgment and will establish his kingdom. But before that happens, again, there are things that have to happen first. And so Paul says here that there's this rebellion or, or the word really is apostasy there, a falling away that must come first. It's not exactly clear necessarily what this falling away is. Uh, the context may suggest that it has something to do with the revealing of the Antichrist. And it may be this massive turning within the visible church who prove themselves to be false converts by denying the faith that they once professed. Which, to some degree, there has been an apostasy, there has been a falling away throughout church history. But that would not be what Paul was referring to here. Uh, we've even recently seen a, a plethora of well-known Christian leaders fall away. But that's not what Paul was referring to here. Jesus talks about that during the tribulation there will be an apostasy. Also, I don't think that's what Paul is referring to here. Uh, the Greek makes it very clear there is a specific falling away that he is referring to, the apostasy. And I think it's probably something that will be marked by being unprecedented. And so something that we have not yet seen. And then the next thing Paul says has to happen is that the man of lawlessness has to be revealed. This is the Antichrist. Again, as we saw in 1 John, John tells us there are many antichrists already in the world, those who oppose Christ. But the antichrist is coming. 
He is the man of lawlessness, which is a title that describes his character. He's lawless according to God's law. He is in open opposition to God and leads others in opposition to God as well. To be lawless is to be sinful, right? First John tells us that, that sin is lawlessness. Matter of fact, there are some manuscript texts that say he is the man of sin. So this man of lawlessness, he's also described at the end of verse 3 as the son of destruction. To say he's the son of destruction means that he belongs to destruction, that his destiny is destruction. Now we'll see that this will be a powerful man, and he will come empowered by Satan, but he won't prevail. No matter how evil he is, no matter how much power he is, he cannot prevail against our sovereign God and our Lord, and he will not. And that should give us hope as we think about this, because no matter how evil things seem to get in our world and how evil seems to prevail, the believer can continue to stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ, for in the end it is our God who prevails. He has destined the final day and all the means that will unfold to that end. So no matter what, our hope is secure. Evil will be dealt with. And even the man of lawlessness will be destroyed, as our God has the final victory. As our God, mighty in power, sovereign over all, worthy of our adoration, of our praise, of the submission of our very lives. For he is the Lord who will stand victorious when he returns. And he will bring that victory to all who entrust their lives to him in full surrender and submission to him. My friends, if you will turn from your sin and turn to Jesus Christ trusting in him alone for your salvation. He who is God, who lived perfectly in this world as a man, and then went to the cross as the perfect sacrifice to offer himself in the place of all who would put their trust in him. He who shed his blood for the forgiveness of sin, who stood in the place of God's wrath for us, who deserve his wrath. He who died for us. He who was buried and yet on the third day rose in victory over sin and death. He brings his victory to all who trust in him. If you will trust in him, you will find the evil within you dealt with. You will find your sins forgiven as he brings you the victory. And the day is coming when all evil in the world will be dealt with. That the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be destroyed and all of Christ's enemies will be crushed under his feet. That is a great day. What a great God and Savior we serve. That the victory is his and his alone. And he brings that victory to all who have faith in him. Yes, the Antichrist is coming. And when he comes, he will be a power to reckon with. Verse 4 says that he will exalt himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. This is the apex of his lawlessness, his blasphemy to claim deity of himself. As if he is the one and only who should be worshipped. The depths of the gall that'll be in this man. The wickedness to declare himself God shows that his eternal destruction is warranted and just. That he would even attempt to usurp the one who truly is deserving of all worship, the one who truly is the ruler over all. And you know, such an attempt to depose God from his throne really should be something familiar to us, right? Because that is the very arrogance that caused Satan and his minions to be cast out of heaven. And so it's no wonder that we see in verse 9 that the Antichrist's coming is in accordance to the work of Satan. Satan is still trying to depose God from his throne. And the day will come when he will 
use the Antichrist. And the Antichrist will seat himself in the Jewish temple, that which represents God's presence. And he will seat himself there to declare himself as God. And so we see, uh, Paul talks about these things. And he's saying these things have to happen. And as he mentions this apostasy and the revealing of the Antichrist, we see here that these are all things Paul had already told the Thessalonians about. That they should have known this was going to take place. You know, just like we saw in the first letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. That as he was working through some of the things that he was addressing there in the church, he's saying, listen, I already told you all this. And he referred back to when him and Silas were there and what they taught the Thessalonians. And so he's doing this again here. Remember, you should, you should know this already. I told you this. They knew what was the revealed word of God. And so they should not have let some teaching come in and derail them. You know, and, and us too. We need to remember what the Bible says. We need to, be, we need to remember what we've been taught from the scriptures. That we would not be derailed. That whatever wind and wave of doctrine would not come and toss us back and forth and cause us to go into a tizzy like the Thessalonians. We need to hold true to the word of God. We have that which is his revealed word, his truth. Paul also told them in verse 6 that they knew what power it was that would restrain the Antichrist from being revealed until the right time. And so since they knew, Paul doesn't specifically identify the restraining. He already told them, so he didn't have to identify it here. But it's interesting, because we see in verse 6, it would seem that there's something that restrains him. But then in verse 7, it's clear that there's someone who restrains him. And there's much speculation about this, about who it is and what it is. Some say that what restrains the Antichrist from being revealed is the gospel going out into the world and being preached. Others say that it is governments. Uh, I don't know about that one. Revelation shows that there are governments in the time of the Antichrist, and they are satanically influenced. And then others say that what is restraining is the church. And who is restraining is the Holy Spirit's work in and through his church. And so that would mean that when the rapture happens and the church is taken out of the world, then he who restrains is then taken out of the way. And therefore, opening the door for the Antichrist to step on the scene in God's timeline. That tends to be where I lean, but I hold that in a loose fist. Because Paul doesn't say. The Thessalonians already knew, so he doesn't have to specifically say. Um, so I think we need to hold that in a loose fist, wherever we fall when it comes to that. But what is true right now, and what was true when Paul was writing this letter, is what he says there in verse 7, when he says the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Uh, the word mystery refers to something that was hidden before, but has now become revealed. And as the world grows in its opposition against Christ, as people deny what they innately know, suppressing the truth in unrighteousness, denying the God who created them, growing in their rebellion, hatred of truth, and denying the Lord and the only sovereign. We see that. And as I already referenced 1 John, again, there are are already many antichrists in the world, already many who oppose Christ. But it's leading up to that one antichrist coming and stepping into view. When he who restrains him is out of the way, verse 8 says, and then the lawless one will be revealed. And then when Paul says that, he jumps to then when Christ returns to identify who this lawless one is, that he is the one whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. When the Antichrist has obtained the fullness of his power by Satan's influence, 
when the world sees him as unstoppable, when he comes against, with the full armies of all the world, God's chosen people, Israel, Christ will appear. And Christ will rescue his people, Israel. And he will destroy all his enemies. He will win the day with just a word. And the Antichrist, according to Revelation 19, will be cast into the lake of fire. When Jesus returns, he will bring this man of lawlessness to nothing. All the great powers of the world, all the greatness of men, when Christ comes, will be nothing. And that includes the greatest and most powerful of them all, who is yet to come. He is really nothing. Jesus is all. Jesus is greater. So no matter how great evil may seem in the world today, and how great it may seem it's progressing, remember Jesus is greater still. Because the evilest of all is, amounts to nothing when Jesus appears. Nothing can take away hope that is in this great Savior. Nothing else can save. Only Jesus is the victor. And Jesus will have the last word. He will win the day. He will win the victory. He will destroy the man, the son of destruction, by the breath of his mouth. And so, my friends, if you're looking at the world spinning seemingly chaotic and all the evil around you, and it is stirring you up, it is causing you to go into a tizzy, turn to Jesus. Jesus, who is greater still. Turn to him, for in him is the secure hope. Turn to Jesus in his greatness and his glory for who he is. Trust in him, and you will be anchored no matter what storm comes around you. No matter what evil threatens our stability, you'll be anchored in him who is the victor. And again, this is true as we see the power that is in the Antichrist when he comes. Verse 9 says that he will come by the activity of Satan, deceiving with power and false signs and wonders. Yet again, he's going to be made nothing when Christ returns. And this power that's on display in the Antichrist, again, it will not be his own, but Satan's power on display through him. But those who will be deceived, according to verse 10, are those who are perishing. Those whom God has chosen as his own from before the foundation of the earth, they will not be deceived by these Signs, false signs and wonders. There will even be those who are saved in the tribulation and they won't be filled, fooled. Only those who do not belong to God, only those who do not put their trust in Christ and continue to reject him. For those who do not trust Christ, who do not know the work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts, who therefore continue as dead men who can do nothing to save themselves... To be turned over to their sins is what they will be given. They will be destined for the destruction of all of those who oppose Christ. To meet the just penalty of their sin. They're the ones that are described here as those who refuse to love the truth and so be saved. They will not love the truth. They, will, they hate the truth. And so they won't be saved. And so, my friends, if you have not repented of your sin, if you have not turned to Jesus alone to save you, if you have yet to cry out to him to repent of the falsehood that you may have been believing in, my friend, do it now. Don't wait. Do it today. Do not despise the truth that has been presented to you and so perish, but trust in Jesus do not hate the truth, love the truth. Hate your sin. But love the truth. And you who love the truth, preach the truth to others and to yourself. Cherish the truth and stand firm in the truth that you would not be easily shaken and moved. 
but be anchored in the truth you dearly love. But for those who do perish, since they did not love the truth, they continue to reject. The day is coming when God is going to pull back his grace, when his patience will run out, when he has set the time for it to run out. And he will no longer give the opportunity for them to repent. And he will, as we see in verses 11 to 12, send them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Those who perish reject the truth. They hate God. They reject the God of the Bible. And they will perish. God will pull back his grace and allow them to be deceived and be led astray and seal their fate. My friends, we must love the truth and not reject the God of the Bible. You know, there are even those who claim to love the God of the Bible, that they believe in him, but they then not look to the Bible as their authority of what they believe about him, to seek the truth of who he is. The scriptures are not their authority for who this God is that they claim to love and believe in. Their own feelings or their opinions or how they were raised is the authority, and that allows them then to create a God of their own liking, a God that they are more comfortable with, a God that will allow them to choose their sin and instead of fighting against it, love it, And they will show them that they do not believe the truth. As they are tossed back and forth by every wind and wave of doctrine. As they chase after the the feel-good teaching. They show that they do not love the truth. They do not believe the truth. And my friend, if that is you, I pray the Holy Spirit convicts your heart. That he'll show you your need for the Savior. He will show you your sin. He will show you the evil in your own heart. And he will bring you to a knowledge of the truth that you would repent and believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation. That you would run to flee to him for refuge from the wrath to come. That you would love him and love his truth, embracing him as Savior and Lord. And if you love the truth, you confess Jesus is your Lord, this Jesus who is, my friends, the Jesus who is the very embodiment of truth, then stand firm in the truth. Do not let circumstances, do not let the world events, do not let let every wave of doctrine come and sway you from standing firm in Christ, but continue to grow and pursue maturity as you walk with him. Take great hope in the truth of Christ. Jesus is our sovereign Lord. The world is in his hands. The victory is his And he brings the victory to all who trust in him and love the truth. My friend, our hope is secure in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. The Jesus of the Bible. And he has given us his truth and his word that we may hold fast to it and know him. And in knowing him, know our great hope of eternity with him. So my friends, hold to the truth. Do not be easily shaken or alarmed. Hold to the truth of God's revealed word and pursue discernment, pursue maturity in him as you live for his honor and his glory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visit nvbc.com